Colonel Moran. Your punctuality itself. Has everything proceeded according to schedule? Indeed it has. Number 10, Moran Moriarty, with brackish cigar case at midnight exactly. Perfect. With one exception. A trifling one, perhaps. But I simply do not happen to be Colonel Moran. Sherlock Holmes. At your service. I can well imagine the profundity of your disappointment, Professor Moriarty. And you cannot fail to realize that there can only be one explanation for my having successfully penetrated the most carefully concealed lodgings in the whole of London. I observe your choice of decorations is fully as disagreeable as your choice of profession. Where's Colonel Moran? In custody. As are Quint, Adelspid, Stryker, and Nickers. In short, Professor, your entire organization here in Britain is now occupying cells in Bow Street Police Station, and the assassination of Lord Brackish has failed. Damn and blast you for the meddler that you are, sir with your West End ways, talking down your upper-class nose and only happy when you're dressing up as someone else as though life was some schoolboy lark. Blast you, Holmes. Blast you. I suggest you attempt to get hold of yourself. Your rage is beginning to affect your speech. Did you come alone tonight? Since you asked? Yes. I thought as much. I know your methods by now. Your inability to resist the tour de force, the coup de grace, the necessity of nourishing your ego unassisted. Atrocious. Along with your French. Yes, and my only regret is I must leave alone. Your cohorts refuse to implicate when Colonel Moran fears for his life to do so. But be warned, Professor. Your people have been captured and you are alone. Alone and helpless. And I will have you yet. Mr. Holmes, your interference in my affairs has gradually grown from mild annoyance to insufferable impertinence. Tonight's actions have finally rendered you intolerable to me. Really? Only tonight? You've been intolerable to me much longer than that. Would you be good enough to observe this? <laughs> And this. This. Not to mention this. Mr. Holmes, there are more than a dozen ways to kill a man in this room. And that trap door into the Thames will remove all traces of the man's ever having been here. Do you wonder why I haven't employed any of these devices against you? Well, it's not for want of trying. No because they don't suit me. I will destroy you, but in my fashion. Will you? Yes. I'm going to crush you so that your humiliation and downfall will be witnessed by the entire world. How fascinating. And just how do you propose to do that? The crime of the century, the past century, and all the centuries to come is in preparation. It will go forward as planned despite the temporary setback your interference has caused me. It will go forward. It will take place. And, Mr. Holmes, it will take place before your very eyes, and you will be powerless to prevent it. The world will keep at its immensity. And when the world discovers it occurred within arm's length of the incomparable Sherlock Holmes, the world will sneer, the world will ridicule, the world will hound you into oblivion. And that is why I haven't employed any of the means at my disposal in this room. I have other plans for you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Have you? I, on the other hand, have the same plan I've always had for you. To see you swing at the end of a hangman's rope. And I have no doubt that mine will be the plan that prevails. It's a pity about the chandelier. It was the only item in the room that showed the merest modicum of style. Don't disturb yourself. I'll show myself out.
Watson. Breakfasting? Oh, how'd you work that out, Holmes, eh? Oh. You mind awfully, Watson. You know I have little head for humor when there's nothing to occupy me but staring out of rain street windows at the other side of the street. It has been three days since I broke the back of Moriarty's organization, and there has not been a single letter or a caller worthy of my attention. As my official biographer, Watson, you've precious little with which to occupy yourself these days. You'll soon be afflicted with the same boredom that I am suffering. Oh, well, I'm certain things will change before long, eh, Holmes? By the by, within a fortnight's time, you'll be getting a letter from America. How on earth do you know that? Oh, stealing a bit of your thunder, eh, Holmes? Mystified you, eh? Thoroughly. Now, oh, listen to this. The theatrical section. Our Broadway correspondent reports that on the 31st of this month, Daniel Furman's production of Sir Arthur Pinero's The Second Mrs. Tanqueray will open at the Empire Theatre in New York. In addition to Mr. Kendall, Mr. Huntley, Mr. East, and Miss Campbell, the distinguished cast will include in her first non singing role, Irene Adler. Dash it all, Holmes. I was dead set on astonishing you. You have, Watson. Your ability to extract the single item of unalloyed interest from the massive wordage of the times is an extraordinary facility. Oh. Well, she's never failed to send you first night tickets, eh, Holmes? Never. Always row B, seats five and seven. The last nine seasons. One of these days, we must find ourselves in those seats, eh, Watson? Oh, oh. Well, they've gone begging far too long. Come in. The post has just come. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, could I make you some hot tea? Yes, and uh, a slice or two of that gammon yes. if there's any left. Watson. You must apologize to the transatlantic mails. Your estimate of a fortnight lacks 13 days of proving itself accurate. A rugby as usual, eh, Holmes? Seats fine. Holmes, what is it? Well, that's a rum and eh, Holmes? Whatever she tear him up for like that? Watson, there's not a moment to lose. We must set out for New York this very day, engage passage immediately. Yes, yes, at once. Waterloo Station, driver. We've 40 minutes to catch the boat train. I am trying to connect two events that, by all sense of logic, cannot be connected. Truly a futile exercise. Well, what are they? Oh, my conversation with Moriarty three nights ago and the receipt of those shredded theatre tickets this morning. Well, how could the one have the remotest connection with the other? I don't know, Watson. I don't know. And yet, if I were Moriarty and my one unwavering determination of the destruction of Sherlock Holmes, I would expend every effort at my command to seek out the single, the, the only chink in his armor, however small it may be. And once I had found it, if it exists at all, it is there I should thrust with all the strength and fury I could muster. Chink in your armor? Rubbish! There's no such thing as a chink in your armor. Listen to you, Watson. They don't have handsome cabs in New York, just cabs. Cab! Over here, my man. You see, Watson? Get our cases of all as quickly as you can, will you? The Empire Theatre, and don't spare your steam. Jump in, Watson. Thank you. <laughs>
Wait just on half past three. Eight, Holmes. What are you talking about? Half past eight. See? Watson, we are on New York time. Oh. Oh, well, I've always found Greenwich time perfectly adequate to my needs. I see no reason for changing it now. Hello, what's this? Oh. How do I get through here? You don't. Go around the south end of Lafayette Square. That'll take a half an hour. Driver, what is this? It's the new subway, sir. Subway? It's a subway. It's their word for underground. Now that he mentions it, I recall reading of its construction. New York's first, I understand. Do you mean to tell me they don't have an underground railway here? That stands to reason, doesn't it? They don't have hansoms. Driver, where are we now? Eighth Avenue, sir. Almost to 34th Street. Good. Come along, Watson. The Empire Theatre's on 39th with Crawley. The walk will do us good. Driver, would you be kind enough to get our cases to the Algonquin Hotel the best way you're able? I'm sure that this will take care of any inconvenience. Thank you. Come along, Watson. We walk this distance tenfold on a single afternoon in London. Heads up, mister. I say, look here. 